Parallel Session A, Extreme Weather Events, Changing River Flows, and Rising Sea Levels. In recent years, monitoring stations and people observed more extreme events in the Mekong Basin, including heavy rainfall events, severe floods and drought, and salinity intrusion due to the rising sea levels. The extreme events caused significant impacts on infrastructure, crops, fisheries, ecosystems, and the livelihoods of millions in the basin, particularly in poor and rural areas. This session will discuss new evidence of extreme weather events, changing river flows, and rising sea levels in the Mekong countries, as well as priority needs for climate policy actions to reduce risk and its impacts in the region. So right now, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Tanapon Piman, Senior Research Fellow of the Stockholm Environment Institute, Asia Center. Hello, good afternoon. So uh, this is a first challenge already, <laughs> how to bring people from lunch <laughs> immediately to the sections, and also how to uh, make people active after good lunch. You know, so <laughs> please help me also to uh, uh, do active participation for these sections. So uh, yeah, I mean uh, the main uh, purpose of this section is to uh, go deep dive more about the extreme events, uh, changing for changing rainfall patterns, and also maybe look into the uh, sea uh, uh, level rising in the delta. As you already. Uh, see some evidence this morning that uh, Dr. Sutat uh, present about the Mekong extreme projection, you know. So this section we will uh, try to deep dive, maybe look into uh, country specific and try to see how the evidence or maybe uh, observation, you know, from the ground will support uh, the uh, uh, key finding from the regional level. Also, uh, we already foresee that uh, the protection is also depend on uh, many kind of scenario, many models. So uh, it is important for us as a scientist and also for the policy maker to deal with uncertainty. You know, so that's why the discussion can be related to how we gonna use this uncertainty information from the protection from the observation for the long-term planning for climate adaptation in example and also uh, i would like all the participant also who has experience particularly at the uh, local or national level on the adaptation particularly linked to extreme events unusual rainfall, you know, storm, how people affected or how they try to adapt and even how a policy or a government agency try to support. This is a right section for you to share the opinion, to discuss and also try to help us to form maybe key uh, climate action that we can bring this message to the COP28 next year. Yeah, so uh, I will uh, start now for the uh, section by first introduce the uh, a panel or key speaker. First is from uh, uh, Jula Longkorn University, Dr. Piatida. So she is an assistant uh, professor from the Faculty of Water Resort Engineering. So Dr. Piatida, please. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I tried to look at the back that you sit with Ajahn Chayut. So, yeah, please. Yes, yes. And uh, second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Sotia Kem. He also have a long uh, experience with the Mekong River Commission in the Flood and Drought uh, uh, Center in Cambodian. So he has real operator, so he can also share his experience on extreme even unusual flow in the Mekong. And the last one is also very important, uh, Mr. Tien from Kanter, 
He is like a 20 year experience working in climate change, uh, natural resource management, biodiversity. So he can represent uh, Mekong Delta, that how Delta adapt to the climate change and also uh, sea level rise. So please clap your hand to him. So uh, the, the flow of this section is we will keep uh, around 8, maximum 10 minutes for each speaker to have a, a, a presentation or talks. And after that, we will start dialogue actions. So yeah, please let me speak only. Please help me work as well. <laughs> Otherwise, my board will not happy if you quiet, look at the computer, you know. So please make it like kind of informal discussion. I would like I would like to say that. Okay, let me go on the stage too. <laughs> so uh, first, I may ask uh, Dr. Piatida uh, to uh, have a, a talk about uh, her presentation regarding for uh, uh, focusing in Thailand, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pia Chida from Jilalongkorn University, Thailand. And um, it's very honored to be joining the roundtable discussion today on the extreme weather events and changing river flows and rising sea levels. And um, I'm actually like, do not have much experience yet in the in the Mekong region, but um, today I would like to focus on the uh, perspective on the extreme weather events and the um, some policy actions that uh, have been taken. So, my uh, okay. So my first um, my first uh, main point is on the uh, the big question on the extreme events whether uh, what we are experiencing uh, either flood or drought are they really um, extreme or are they like uh, fluctuation and variation and also another big question in terms of the variation versus the climate change and Dr. Tanapon um, gave us very challenging questions whether um, there's a <laughs> evidence supporting uh, what we are experiencing is it a um, climate change or not so i select the data from japraya river so um, sorry that it's not in the mekong river basin but we have a very long records of the data so the rad royal irrigation department of thailand they record the data here for um, 67 years so it's quite um, a long record and when we try to analyze the peak flow the annual maximum peak flow from 1956 until last year 2022 and this is the uh, flood frequency curve that we we get so for the big flood in thailand in 2011 is it um, extreme event? Yes, extreme event in terms of the damage. But um, when we look at the um, hydrological uh, of the peak flow in 2011, actually the return period is not um, that long. The return period is about um, 24 years. So what does it mean? So the Yes, we have um, peak flow of about 4,700 cubic meter per second. And this is not the highest either for the past 67 years. In 2006, we uh, have almost 6,000 cubic meter per second of the peak flow at C2 station. So C2 station is uh, merging between uh, or like Bing Wang Yom Nan, so Bing and, and Nan uh, merging together. So it's um, the control point for the flood management in the lower Jiao Praya River Basin, including Bangkok. So um, the, in, the data here is very important for um, the flood mitigation. And also in 1995, we also have big flood and the peak flow is actually higher than um, 2011. 
but the damage from 2011, you know, because uh, we have a lot of social and economic development, especially the industrial park in the floodplain in the Ayutthaya, and also, um, you know, how we manage the, the water and also the reservoir operation. So from, from uh, the analysis and the picture that I, that I show you, so the question is, um, when we are talking about extreme events, like um, it, it cannot be standalone, right? Because we have to take into account the, the um, land use, the social and economic development that uh, even though it's not like uh, a very long return period, or what it means is that the probability of happen, you know, it's not that low. So um, it can, it, it possible to to have uh, this kind of peak flow again, and then uh, how we going to um, plan and to mitigate and also to adapt to this kind of um, not so like extreme, but extreme in terms of the the damage to all the sectors, and also for. Um, Maybe I, I go to my another slide first. But uh, for this year, we are experiencing um, very low rainfall, and we expect to uh, experience in the next year also. So, for um, in terms of the 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 policy and also the um, action plan. Actually, the Office of the National Water Resources, ONIP of Thailand. So just in July this year, uh, they already changed to Department of Climate Change and Environment, DCCE. And um, they developed the platform for the spa uh, spatial risk map from climate change for Thailand. They um, consider many um, data and indicators for um, six sectors, including water. And the example that I show you here is the risk map of uh, drought. So they um, have the database behind by um, the team of uh, many, many professor and expert from uh, Ram Kham Hang University for uh, the GCM Dow scaling, that part of the um, Cordex. Uh, network and also um, expert in in different sectors developing this platform and they are trying to do the spatial map so that uh, people in uh, different area they can uh, visualize they can see how each uh, factor affecting uh, each sector and this is just to show an example for the drought risk map comparing between uh, the past 1970 to 2005 and 2046 to 2065 using RCP 4.5. So uh, we can see Nakhon Rajasima Korat that has a pretty high uh, risk on drought. Uh, from the past and also uh, more intensify in, in the near future. So this kind of information uh, provide uh, the basis for uh, some plannings for adaptation and it's accessible, uh, publicly accessible for anyone that are uh, interested in uh, looking into the, the issue that uh, matter in their uh, area. And another uh, big question that Dr. Thanapon uh, shared with us is that, um, you know, whether we can uh, investigate the climate change uh, impact, whether what we are uh, experiencing is it variation or climate change. So we really need um, long-term data. And it's um, climate change is uh, not a local scale, as all of you know. It's, regional is global scale. So 
we really need the um, regional analysis. And I think Dr. Kim will uh, mention about that in, on the regional uh, region. So this is uh, the picture that I put here. It's just showing the, um, the, the tropical storms that occurred in 2011 during the big flood in Thailand. So uh, we have like five storm uh, came that year and these five storm like they passed through like the Philippines, um, Vietnam, Laos and before coming to Thailand. So for us, for Thailand, uh, the effect is much less than like Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Laos. So the storm already dissipated when it reached Thailand. So for us to really understand uh, on the regional scale, you know, we cannot just only looking at the data or what happened in Thailand. We really need to like um, look at the, the big picture and work together with um, researchers, uh, staff, everyone from you know the country in in the, in the region to actually sharing the knowledge, sharing the research, and also sharing the analysis together to actually understand you know how how the large scale uh, process affect our um, climate and weather system and as a result uh, affecting the extreme events yeah so in terms of the policy actions uh, Thailand uh, put together in the uh, master plan the 13 master plan on climate change as well and focusing for the social focusing on the knowledge and also raising awareness for the people you know where uh, where you stay, is it a low-lying area, the floodplain area? You know, how uh, you, you need to understand uh, um, your area and also for the land use planning. And for academic or for research, as I mentioned, you know, we uh, need resources for the research platform for the regional analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Piyatida, to give a kind of uh, experience from Thailand. And I can capture a key uh, message that she talked about climate change needs long term data monitoring to look at uh, kind of or distinguish between variation uh, cycle or, you know, climate change. Second, also, uh, I see that the Thailand have reforms. Uh, ONEP into a new department that try to take on climate change igloo, uh, issue specifically. And yeah, the third one is about the uh, regional cooperation to monitor or to look at the climate as a big picture, not very specific uh, uh, country itself. Okay, so one quick question from John. <laughs> Uh, two quick questions. One is, how does the cooperation work within Thailand between university, ONWR, ONEP, HII? And secondly, when you say it's important for the region, uh, Dr. Sultat spoke of the, the ASEAN hydroinformatics cooperation. So how does that work? And do all the Thai agencies participate in that and the universities? Or is it just one or other? Because as a visitor, it's hard for me to work it out. Thank you. So um, maybe Dr. Sutai can also <laughs> share. Is he here? Um, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe as an <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, personally, I uh, also work closely with um, HII, developing the operation system for the. Um, satellite bias correction and also flood forecasting. So that's um, kind of the collaboration that we have and also capacity building together with um, HII. And also uh, we have many uh, supporting and collaboration with um, other Thai government 
office like ONWR, uh, DWR, RID, and supporting in terms of the uh, research and academic, but not only um, like deep, deep dive research, but also on the um, practical issue. Like recently, um, my colleague also has uh, the analysis on, you know, the annual rainfall and also the um, irrigated area. And very interestingly, like it ha has very high correlation and we can um, try to estimate like the damage from if we have very low rainfall, like this year, you know, how much uh, damage that would be result and like uh, in terms of the the high level policy and also at the at the ground level yeah thank okay you. thank you uh, uh Piyatida. so we we will have more chance to come back and discuss thank you john for ice breaking question so next i would like to move to uh, dr sutir from uh, practitioner and operator experience you know look into the hydro flood and down in the mekong please dr sutir yeah yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tanapon for letting me in this session. And also, I would like to thank for the SEI and um, Ocean Partnership who could uh, organize this session. And all of people are here around the Mekong region, also the global. I think it's a great honor. And on behalf of the MOC Secretariat of uh, Dr. Anula, I'm Kem Sotir. I'm working at the flood and drought management center in based in Phnom Penh because we have two main office uh, uh, two of uh, two office one main office in Dinchen that are run by the MOC Secretariat and uh, uh, a sub regional center at Phnom Penh just doing on the flood forecasting and drought uh, prediction and on behalf of this uh, working on of the regional flood and drought management center I would like to have some word and reporting what this is and uh, what this is and have been happened in the lower Mekong Basin and taking into account for the uh, climate change as you have already known by uh, our colleague this morning concern about the climate change and of course that is, it is connecting to the rainfall intensity or rainfall amount that have been uh, 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 captured in the lower Mekong Basin and of course that uh, in this year you can see in early from uh, uh, May to August the rainfall is seem to be a little bit higher than long-term average however that we use the uh, uh, forecast rainfall based on the NASA uh, satellite data that the uh, rainfall seem to be uh, low uh, lower than long-term average in uh, in the near future especially from uh, October uh, to November and also pass to the uh, next year to uh, 2024. This is what we are concerned on the climate change in the lower Mekong Basin and we are concerned on the uh, uh, low flow that could be happen in the our Mekong region and that's why water management content should be considered all together especially not in the individual uh, agency but also the national and sub-national uh, region and as you see this is the uh, capturing all the general situation of the rainfall that uh, we have been recorded into our Mekong region and this is this uh, we are concerned about the what's happening inside uh, the Mekong region and for the flood, uh, regional flood and drought management center we are doing on uh, daily flood forecasting and also the drought prediction but uh, drought at this moment is not much concern because we have more rainfall uh, inside our region and now we are doing on daily flood forecasting but only for the mainstream along the Mekong River from Chiang San in Thailand to Nguyen Tien and pass to Stung Trang and Tang Chau and Chau Dok in Vietnam. So all uh, information are issued in uh, every morning and of course we are appreciated to the uh, member country who also sharing our uh, data information every day. So we based on this sharing information from each member country, we are producing the uh, daily bulletin 
and the daily bulletin have consists all the uh, flight forecasting from day one to day five and specific how the distance from uh, each uh, level to the uh, alarm or flood level. So I think some of them of us here, I think have received our daily flood bulletin. And beside this one, we also um, working on the uh, flood flood guidance system, but uh, we just consider on what are connecting the flow into the uh, Tunle Sap Lake because of our colleague, uh, the lady from Cambodia this morning also mentioned about the uh, concern of the low flow of Tunle Sap Lake that concern to the uh, ecological system in Cambodia and impact of course to the uh, livelihood of the community living around the area. So now up to this date that the low flow of the Tunle Sap Lake have been observed. So this is uh, mostly uh, can be uh, revealed on what the consecutive year of low flow in the past, especially from uh, 20, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021 and 2022. This is uh, not much uh, inflow from the Mekong River into the Tunle Sap Lake and also the uh, uh, rainfall intensity in the Tunle Sap Lake and around the area have been uh, 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 low recorded. This is uh, why now the low volume or the low flow of the Tunle Sap that have been observed at this moment. That, that, that you can see the, in the graph that the uh, volume of the flow at the Tunle Sap have been lower than its long-term average. This is what we are concerned. And in the future, if uh, the low rainfall and uh, uh, contribute in this uh, year, it could be foreseen into next year how the Tunle Sap can be affected. This is what we're concerned for, for, for the near future. And of course, uh, to, to do this effect, uh, we uh, MOC at the regional level, we have been uh, uh, conducted many uh, uh, activity related to environmental uh, analysis. I think we have another a division who have been done for water quality, who have uh, an analyze on uh, water impact on the hydro system, hydro power system, and of course at the uh, technical division of the MOC also we are doing on the uh, 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 PMFM regarding to the procedure of flow, uh, maintenance of flow in the river. So all are this in, we are updating daily and weekly and update to, into our website of the MOC. So the MOC have been uh, 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 collect all information based on the contrib uh, contributed uh, data information from the each member country, as I already mentioned. And also the flood flood, as I uh, show here, we just uh, show that MOC have been used our flood flood guidance system. We predict, not a prediction, but just a guidance for a one hour, three hour, six hour, and 24 hour that uh, can be a cool and concentra uh, concentrated in to any specific region in our subvision. And uh, the flood flood also uh, can uh, update in our website. I think I would encourage all of you, if you are interested, please uh, go into our MOC website and you can find more information, not only the flood and drought or, or flood flood, but also be capturing, summarizing, uh, summarizing the uh, uh, weekly report of uh, hydrological analysis in the lower Mekong Basin. So uh, uh, I, I, I would uh, uh, incorrect if you have a uh, uh, time, please go to our website. Yes, yeah, just uh, just only summary, uh, summarize what we have been done. So in fact, the uh, Mekong River have been served for uh, 70 million people that uh, we need to provide energy, transport, tourism, as I already have been presented by our colleague this morning uh, concerning about the climate change and could be uh, 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 happen uh, our uh, future of uh, low flow in 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 our, in our uh, Mekong region and flood risk can be minimized through our various form uh, of land use like you see at flood not only in the river but also at happen at any side of the uh, uh, sub basin or sub uh, catchment that can be uh, 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 happen like landslide or whatever. Like yesterday, they have a big flood, flood, flood in Vietnam. So in in northern Vietnam, 
so it's, it's, it's a huge black make a huge landslide over there and cause a lot of damage in uh, uh, the nation and of course of drought is the also uh, bring our sexual uh, 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 social economic uh, hardship to Ukrainian country and we are doing on flood prediction in weekly monthly and three monthly uh, for our updating so now we are on uh, developing our information uh, to integrate all flood and drought and also we have been developed the uh, long-term and medium-term flood for the Mekong uh, region so I hope in the near future in our MLC website will be included the long-term a uh, medium and long-term of flood and drought that uh, this can be shared to our public and other stakeholder in our region to understand and learn about the uh, uh, flood in the upcoming flood or uh, the in, in, in next year flood that can be uh, rely on our uh, information and this is what uh, the MOC have been done and I think uh, from now if you think uh, we can supplement to all the information that you would like to know no please uh, I'm uh, welcome for your question thank you okay thank you very much uh, Dr. Sutia to uh share your experience uh, with the MRC in terms of producing uh, very important information for the region, for the country. So I would like to ask if there are any, oh, okay, burning questions. Uh, two, three. Okay, maybe uh, let's try to have a quick, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Open it. Uh, my name is Suvel. I'm a journalist, environment journalist for RFA. I wanted to ask, sir, um, about uh, the Mekong uh, River flow. It's at lowest level in last few weeks. Is that correct? Yes, uh, you are correct because uh, most of the station are staying about one or two meter below its long-term average. But now, recent, just a few days before, we have. Uh, uh, over, I um, mean, over uh, every rainfall happened inside our low income, but now some of the station water level are rising up. Okay. Actually, one of the things that I wanted to ask was about the dam upstream. How much of that is affecting the low, uh, historically low uh, Mekong? Um, water level downstream in lower uh, Mekong Basin because this seems to be a problem that happens almost every year uh, sometimes a little bit more sometimes a little bit less this wet season to have this low is an anomaly probably but has there been any um, thing done uh, 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 as a regional uh, cooperation talking to um, for example, China or other countries for a regional mechanism to tackle this issue. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. And this is so uh, taking to the key point for our flow connecting to the upstream part. As you know that this, uh, uh, the Mekong River have connecting from the upper part, especially from China. And most of the people we talking about the flow of the Mekong, all are concerned from the flow inflow from China. But you have to uh, uh, know that the flow contributed from China just only 16 to 25 percent during the seasonal flow. Especially 60 percent, uh, uh, 16 percent just only in, in the uh, uh, wet season. But mostly the lower Mekong Basin is much more influenced from rainfall. If you think about the inflow from China, of course, have impact nevertheless. But of course, we have to consider on the inflow from our tributary contributed to our main basin into our Mekong. So this is uh, what we think mostly of the lower Mekong basin river flow depend much more on rainfall intensity. And also, of course, inflow from China that uh, uh, we have been obviously seeing the impact, but not much to the downstream part of to Cambodia or order to the Tunle Sub Lake. But of course, we have to control or have to understand about what 
inside the lower mitochondrial basin inflow can be to, uh, contributed. So maybe next, uh, uh, Dr. Chayanit, and then for your question, can I pause for a while and let uh, the last speaker uh, uh, say first, and then I will come back to you the first. Okay, please. Uh, okay, thank you so much for an excellent panel, and I'm so happy to really listen to your talk, especially uh, Kung So Kim Chias, because uh, I want to really uh, convey the big comment and also appreciation to hard work, especially for um, regional flood centers, and because I know that like uh, you do uh, daily forecasting and no, uh, there's no holidays for those people. I used to be working in the flood centers and I know we have holiday, even our kids really have the school break. We cannot, we have to be in the centers to be able to really communicate and really make sure that we have really timely information to share to neighboring country. And um, I just want to have a few questions uh, to consortia. So you mentioned about um, really acknowledging some great uh, cooperation that different country providing the data. And uh, we also understand that some countries, they actually uh, face also difficulty to maintain their uh, data, I mean, their collection services and the station. So how am I see trying to address these issues, uh, especially with, when it comes to uh, the data collections and I understand you use the NASA and others to supplementally. So just to learn a little bit on what are the current situation in terms of the uh, making sure to have the sufficient data for to serve for forecasting. And if there is any need for others, um, stakeholders and uh, partners to uh, support MRC's important work, what will be in terms of data related issues. And the second is, um, is there any uh, further studies or any monitoring uh, report from your side? Uh, how like uh, many users and uh, how they make use of their uh, uh, forecasting information or down monitoring information from, from the MRCs to, uh, for their use? Um, I sometimes uh, uh, talk with uh, uh, people where they did get data, they always refer to MRCs data and support and some uh, people really appreciate that but is there any further uh, information or you collect the information on uh, really like monitoring uh, and evaluation on really how great is the impact for uh, providing such information to to the country and also to communities so that's our two major questions thank you can you try to uh, answer in the chat <laughs> yeah okay first i ask uh, yeah, of course, I would like to thank all Dr. Chinese for supplementing our routine work at the regional level that, of course, we are doing without any holiday during this flood season. And uh, concerning to the uh, data information we have been shared by the, our member country of Cambodia, Lao PDO, Thailand, and Vietnam, I think we uh, first we have to uh, uh, follow with our MOU between the MOC and the member country in, in, in a specific station that had been provided from the member country. And that's why I'm appreciate uh, to the member country who have been deal and sharing with informa information. But up to 2015, that the centralization process of the MOC have been uh, apply our MOC uh, implementing activity. So this is, can be affected to our uh, data sharing information, as uh, Dr. Chinese mentioned about the uh, uh, support of uh, 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 data collection, how we can secure on this one. This 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 is uh, now the national of the uh, national agency have been rely on their uh, national budget, but MOC can be uh, 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 supplemented in some uh, uh, part, not a whole uh, uh, system like we have applied before. So that's why we are now uh, uh, have some problem also because of the uh, uh, old station have been uh, some uh, uh, problem of uh, not operation well and we need some budget to cover to operate uh, to reinstall that station again. So now we try to uh, uh, make country to, to discuss with country to make more available budget for uh, cover this uh, station. However, MRC have some uh, uh, small package also to cover our uh, uh, 
monitoring network like we have been installed Mekong High Cost before and that Mekong High Cost have been uh, still under uh, 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 supported by MOC uh, uh, package. So this is kind of uh, a, a relationship between MOC and member country are still ongoing well and although we have a problem as I mentioned about the uh, number of stations that uh, have problem and for uh, what you mean about the last one uh, the second one is about okay you already provide the information to the national governments and also link to the people right and uh, do you have any study or any kind of uh, research to uh, look at the feedback you know who using the information uh, yeah in fact we have uh, a regularly meeting between uh, regional and national also connecting to the sub-national level and i think most of the information provided from moc just sharing at the national level but from national to sub-national or to uh, 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 community level is is uh, a rule of uh, uh, national uh, rule only but uh, we are re working not only for considering on the uh, 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 researching or what we are studying but we talk directly with the people who are working with the MOC especially from the line agency so this is what we can share what we have Blacking point and we need to supplement the point based on the member country comment. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I need to have move quickly to the last uh, speaker, Mr. Tian, to uh, share his experience, observation in the Mekong Delta regarding to uh, extreme events, uh, sea level rising in particularly. Please. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. And I'm the last but also the least. Speaker, <laughs> my name is Tian, but I uh, know Vietnamese name do, do not make sense to you. Just so you forget my name. I'm just a Delta boy coming from the Delta, and just an ordinary Delta boy. But I am very talented. I've got a talent. When I start talking, people start sleeping. <laughs> so. So, so do, you, do you need some exercise? Huh? I can ask people just stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do some exercise, you know, to support uh, okay. Mr. Tian, you know. He feel uh, pity that uh, he have the, he's the last and the least time <laughs> people to talk. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you can sit down. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, because of my talent. Um, so. I'm going to make it very short and I'm going to make crispy points so that you can take home. Um, what to talk about? <laughs> All right, um, I'm from the Delta. That's the important point. Okay, the first point I want to make is that you cannot um, talk about climate change and climate change adaptation alone without talking about other things because everything is interconnected and you have to address the whole web of issue at the same time not just talked about blah 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 climate change as a standalone thing and in the delta it's a good example of that because um I will have to ask you to imagine um, or look at that one and imagine the delta, okay? Because our position, our situation, um, location at the downstream most um, part of the basin facing the sea. So we are subject to whatever's happening upstream and we are subject to whatever ha happening globally <laughs> and from the sea. And we are subject to the things that we are doing to ourselves also. So anyone learning or haven't heard about the Mekong Delta, you would have heard about a long list of issues. Yes, the Delta is facing a multi-dimensional crisis. Long list of issues. Um, erosion, severe erosion, houses collapsing. 
uh, salinity intrusion is very severe. We lost crops and we are subsiding and a lot of other things. But um, those, the long list can be categorized into three groups. Again, okay? at the sea, it is rising. And the media usually scare the public uh, with, with the projection of one meter, one full meter of sea level rise, and they make it sound like tomorrow morning <laughs> the sea going to rise one full meter and submerge the delta under the, the Pacific Ocean. But the actual rate of, of sea level rise we learned this morning globally is 3.6 millimeter per year. Okay, that's also scary. I'm not a denier. Um, climate change and sea level rise happening for real, but it's not tsunami. It's not tomorrow morning. It's a gradual cumulative process. And to us in the Delta, it's quite, uh, it gives you, still gives you time. And in inland, we are subsiding and quicker, much quicker than that, at the four, three, four times faster. And to us, that's the adaptation deficit or uh, a more urgent priority because uh, we are extracting groundwater too much, like you are living on a watermelon and trying to drink the water, the juice from the watermelon, and the, the melon collapse just like that. Why? Because in the past decade or so, uh, uh, driven by the rice first policy, we produce too much, too much rice, and we, we build too much infrastructure, stopping this and that, anti-salinity and so on, anti-flood and so on. So, and we use a lot of um, uh, chemicals. So we cannot, we can no longer use um, surface water for domestic uses. So we relied on, on drinking the juice from the watermelon, the core of the watermelon. So we're sinking. So that's the first, uh, the, the more urgent priority. Okay, upstream, and yet upstream, we are subject to things happening upstream. Um, the deprivation of sediment and sand that caused the, the, um, the, the rampant erosion, we, we won't discuss that today. And the barriers to fish migration, just mentioned in passing, we don't have time. But I'm going to talk about uh, extreme events because um, in the Delta, we are facing the sea and the, the salinity uh, intrusion boundary is a constant struggle, day and night, year after year, between the two forces, the river force and the, and the sea, and the, the, the sea force, the water from the sea. Whenever the Mekong flows weaken, the sea pushes further inland. As simple as that. So in the dry season, we always have a natural fringe of, of salinity, and that's okay. But in some years, not okay. Because upstream climate change, uh, upstream affects the, the rainfall and the amount of water uh, available in the river. So in some years, the rainfall is so low, like um, 2015, rainfall is so low. So the next dry season, we have too little water. The water level in the, in the river is very low. So at the seafront, um, the, the river is not strong enough to, to push salinity out. So in that year, we had 90 kilometers of salinity intrusion uh, into land. So we had 160,000 hectares of rice damage that year. And, and that's not because of climate change and, and ex, uh, extreme El Nino alone, but also on top of that, we have the hydropower. And, you know, during the, uh, the dry season of a, uh, an extreme year like that, the hydropower um, reservoir, they do not have enough depth to run the turbine below. So they have to, to close the dam to accumulate uh, enough depth of, 
of water for running the the turbine. I think it's 20, 20 meters minimum so that you can run the turbine. And so it takes time for for water to pass the dam because the dam the dam closed. It takes days or weeks to pass each dam. And then you have and then you have a full series cascade of dam. It takes it takes a lot of time. I don't know how much I cannot do the math. Uh, it takes, takes a lot of time for the water to pass a cascade of dam. As a result, in an extreme year, when when salinity is already uh, pushed further into land, we don't have enough water downstream. The dams make it worse. Okay, and uh, so we have learned that from the experience of sixteen, we we had damage, but it repeated one more time in in nineteen uh, and twenty, and so we say okay. Uh, extreme years like this, we can no longer fight. We can no, no longer ad adapt. So we abandon that crop and we change the calendar and we move the crops a little bit earlier and we did okay. So last year we did, we had almost zero damage for the coastal rice crop that year. And we say, okay, that's good. So for the long term, um, we accept that um, for extreme years, we don't have enough water and the hydro hydropower going to make it worse. There's no way for us because no way for us to, to stop the, uh, the saline from coming in. Because when you stop saline from coming in from the sea, the inside, there's no water anyway. So no way to, to uh, adapt to, to the situation like that. So we become wiser and we have developed the Mekong Delta master plan. The number one principle in line with the, uh, in line with the resolution 120 issue before that. And the main spirit of the, of the resolution 120 and the master plan is that from now on, we're going to stop fighting with nature and we're going to adapt, we're going to, uh, adapt accordingly. And we're going to transform our, our agriculture. And we don't take glory in being the second uh, uh, largest rice exporter in the world after Thailand. We give it that glory to Thailand from now on. <laughs> we can reduce our rice production. <laughs> uh, and we're going to retreat, retreat the, uh, the freshwater zone into land so that we don't plant rice uh, in the coastal zone, wrong place. In the wrong time, the dry season. So we're going to retreat the fresh water zone inland and we change um, livelihood, um, the farming system in the, in the intermittent zone. Okay, he's going to kick me out. So <laughs> let me come to the conclusion. We are subject to three sets of issues. Climate change and sea level rise, real but gradual, can, can we have, still have time to adapt? Uh, within the Delta, we've made a lot of mistakes. That can be changed with policy change. And the government of Vietnam is doing that. But upstream, things outside of Vietnam, it's a big challenge. We don't know how to deal with it. And the change of flows and especially the deprivation of sediments, we don't know how to deal with it yet. Okay, that's the conclusion. Very good. Please clap your hand to uh, uh, Mr. Tien that well expressed, uh, you know, what happening in the Delta. And I think people even know experience to the Delta, you can imagine นะ that uh, not only the climate change, but the cumulative effect and also unknown and known. <laughs> I want, don't want to come back that. So maybe uh, I may have a five minute to have uh, a question. Maybe start from the lady. If, uh, uh, Buki, Buki, can you keep the microphone? Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, do uh, anyone would like to ask the, the questions? Please raise the hand so I can uh, prioritize. Uh -huh. While waiting for question, I have a question for you. On why why this room is so full? Ah. Is it 
are we that attractive or are you too lazy to go to other <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much Kap, to help me moderate this section, Look, uh, Mr. Tien. Please, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for all of your insights. My name is Katrin Eidel. I'm a cultural anthropologist, uh, basically affiliated to the USSH University in Ho Chi Minh City at the moment. Um, so actually, I have um, two questions uh, to both of you. Maybe first, um, the first question is regarding the daily um, flood forecasting. And actually, you already um, asked my question, but I wanted to delve a little bit more deeper and I wanted to ask you what explicitly, what kind of data do you use for your forecasting and all, if you also use NASA satellite data, because um, what I find sometimes a bit complicated in this data and data imaginaries are the problem that it shows only when, for example, extreme weather, uh, extreme weather um, happenings occur, but it does not show who is affected actually by it. So, for example, extremely vulnerable groups are not, it's not uh, visible in these kind of imaginaries. So I just wanted to know what kind of data you use actually. And where it comes from, okay, it was partly answered already. And my second question uh, goes to Tien. Um, I, and I remembered your name. <laughs> Um, so um, I'm very interested in how um, the stems and the sea dike um, policies plays out on site actually. When you're saying that you are now trying to transform uh, with this master plan from combating climate change to working with climate change, um, I was just wondering how you evaluate the dams in these scenarios. Um, with regard to that, because these dams were erected mainly for electricity, power, um, and only uh, and also to um, combat floods, for example. So, how does this place, how does it comes into the vision of um, going with climate change and not combating and fighting against it anymore? So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. I take first. Yeah. Thank you for your question. I just. Uh, brief on the, the data information that we need for our flood forecasting. Of course, first we need our, our data from member country, including rainfall and water level. And totally we receive only 108, uh, 38 rainfall station include for 46 uh, water level in the mainstream also at, from the tributary. But uh, you see the uh, lower Mekong Basin area have the acute area that have not covered all the rainfall. That's why we use satellite data from, uh, especially we use data from NASA at the moment. And before we use from NOAA. And because we make a bias correction between the uh, ground station and the uh, satellite data, that's why we apply for our model for flood forecasting. I'm sorry, I didn't really get your uh, questions. Can you um, repeat using simple English? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, Are you I'm asking about dams or dikes? Yeah, both actually, because there is an, um, this uh, sea dike that is proposed somehow to build between the Lower Mekong Delta and Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, nobody knows if this ever will happen. But however, I mean, there are still are dams implemented or still on site in the Mekong Delta. And I was just wondering um, if the master plan um, foresees not to combat uh, climate change, but to go with climate change and with nature, how does uh, how these dam dams come into into play then? Because they actually are built in order to get the fl floods out of, of the Mekong Delta. Okay, let me take the coastal dikes then, uh, because upstream we all, uh, already described. There's three scenarios upstream. Um, normal year, usually upstream. Right? Normal year, normal years, um, the dams will cut off the flood peak and store some of the water in the, in the reservoir and add to the, the, the dry season flow. Okay, but in dry year, um, because of not enough uh, depth, the dam's going to make the drought worse downstream. But in la extreme La Nina year, we, don't, we haven't had yet. Uh, and I expect that in high, high flood year, extreme high flood year, the dams will release water for emergency, for dam safety purpose, and add, add more water to the, flood, to the uh, already flooded downstream so that's dub double flooding okay that's enough for upstream but downstream many people have asked the government of vietnam to build a, a mega sea dike as a strategy to cope with sea level rise and we are sinking and they say look at the dutch look at the netherlands they are in underwater and they are thriving 
and why not why not do the same? So luckily, I just wrote uh, uh, in an article yesterday, waiting to be published. Against that, I made several points. Number one, we are not Dutch. Do I look like a Dutch? No. No, the point is that we, um, the Netherlands in Vietnam, we mistake, uh, we mistook that the Netherlands, the whole Netherlands is under underwater. That's not correct, right? Only 30% about uh, of the Netherlands is underwater because they kept pushing in the last 700 years by building dikes and pump water out using windmills and so on. And now they have also a lot of problems um, in the Netherlands. The land inside also subsiding. The dike is also um, because they built with, with peaty soil. So some of the dike cracks during um, drought year. And also now they are upgrading the dikes because it's 90 years old. Okay, so the delta, uh, not the same not the same as the Netherlands, so we shouldn't build that. Okay, suppose when, when the delta is so low, the sea is so high, you build a mega dike at the seafront to, to keep the sea at bay, and sometimes you miss the sea so much you have to climb the ladder up, up to the dike and gain the view of the sea, and then you climb back, right? But you forget that your people have to go in and out by boat for every day. He's gonna kick me out again. Okay? Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, everyone have to kick out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more minute. Okay. The most important thing is that we are in a tropical context with 2,000 millimeters of, of rainfall. And we're going to be submerged under rainwater fast. If you build a dike to keep the sea in, it will also keep the water from coming out. And we're going to be submerged under two meters of, of rainfall. And we have the mighty Mekong in our back with 475 billion cubic meters of water. So we are not Dutch. Don't build that sea dike. Okay, okay. Cap. So let's have a big hand to our excellent uh, speaker. So yeah, I still, you know, want to talk more, but of course we need to move. Uh -huh. So yeah, thank you very much for our speaker. And I believe that uh, you can have more interaction with the participant and who want to ask more questions coffee break you know after this meeting also you can keep continue this dialogue that is the main purpose of this event so yeah thank you very much yeah